Turn with me to Romans, the first chapter. So I know that God is a blesser. He's a covenant keeper. He does what he says he will do. And because of that, you know, we need to pay attention not only to the blessing that God says that he will pour out upon us, but we need to pay attention also to what God is saying in regards to us keeping our lives holy and not stretching out there and, uh, and being unholy. Amen? So God's called us to be holy. It says, be therefore holy even as I am holy. Whoa, now you want a challenge in life? <laughs> be holy just like God is holy. And so I want us to turn to uh, Romans, the first chapter. And uh, you all are there and I'm still looking. I'm just going to read several verses beginning at verse 18. Romans 1.18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that word suppress means to hold it down. They hold the truth down. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... <clears throat> are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, <clears throat> so that they are without excuse. Excuse me. <clears throat> so they are without excuse. Because, verse 21. Because although they, may, they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and, bir and birds and four-footed animals, creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Father, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord, for the understanding of your word, the discipline that you bring us under in your word, God. And, and the abilities that you give us because we know your word and it enriches our lives. Cause us, Lord Jesus, to read it, Lord, with the understanding, God, that you renew our minds, Lord. And, Father, that you minister to our spirits through this. So we give you praise for it, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So what we have here and what we see is God is laying out what man is up to in regards to who he is and what they should be doing. Now, we've been watching things, Pastor Pam and I, and we were noticing things. And even yesterday, uh, we were out uh, for, oh, oh, was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? Okay. <laughs> we were out driving and coming up to get ready to go to our favorite watering hole, Starbucks there. And on the way from where we were to where we were, there were three different people that, like, didn't stop at stop signs. They just pulled right out in front of us. And one person, one person was on, on one of the streets, Wabash, which is a five-lane street, and they were trying to pull out this way, and we're going this way, and we're going to pull in, so we're in the turn lane. And they got all bent out of shape because we were in a turn lane. And they pulled into the lane going the wrong way. <laughs> the oncoming. To get around us. They didn't stop or anything like that. And uh, we, we got the eye. And with one person, you know, they gesticulated us with the age of age appropriate for them of the number. But anyway, <laughs> you know, what we see is people are 
more and more and increasingly becoming lawless. And when you break down the laws of a nation, like what is trying to happen in our nation right now, and you probably have heard it, different ones are voting, trying to vote police, you know, where they can defund the police. Really? You know, that works until you have an emergency at your house. And then, then when you have an emergency at your house, you know, someone says, call a cop. Well, we don't have any anymore because we don't pay them to come and be a cop. You know, so what we're seeing is this lawlessness that is increasing. And, of course, the scriptures talk about lawlessness or iniquity abounding in the last days. Iniquity, that's what iniquity is, is lawlessness without law. And so what happens is people live in that that structure of the iniquity and it becomes greater and greater in intensity and what happens to the people that are uh, living uh, lawfully is they become those who are accosted by the others who are living without law and uh, you know I've, I've said this before but any program or organization that arises that has some of the uh, tenets of what they do to be violence you know or, or be able to go and like they did in Chicago the other day you know break the windows and you know steal the Gucci purses and all that stuff you know that's lawlessness you know somebody doesn't have a right I remember our pastor used to say this he said your rights stop at the end of my nose and so what happens is is we're seeing a nation that is lawlessness. And what happens, we understand and know that the reason we're living in a lawless time is, number one, because we're coming to the end days, but number two, people have brought themselves out from under the presence and the glory and the discipline of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus gave his life on the cross, he not only uh, uh, advanced grace, but he advanced discipline in that time. Because what Jesus expects from us is to live godly and to walk godly. Uh, there's a, a scripture in uh, Matthew, the 13th chap chapter. Just let me read a few verses here. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. These are the words of Jesus, red letters. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain was sprouted and produced a crop, then the terrors also disappear, also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in our field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. Those are the words of Jesus. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest you gather up the tares and you uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in the bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Good and evil exist. How many know that? And good and evil are going to continue to exist until Jesus says it's time for evil to stop existing. Are you with me on this? Yes. So what happens is there are the tares that represent that which is evil. So the reason that evil exists alongside of good at this point, and God allows it, God allows them to live and to exist, is that they are a message from Satan but also, we are their message from God. So when the tares come, we have a message. It's rooted and founded in God. And it, 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 Jesus came and gave his life for, it, for us. And because he did, he shed his blood for us and opened up the way so evil could be done away with. When Jesus died on the cross and came back uh, from the dead and broke open from the grave, what happened was Jesus took the keys of death and hell, 
sin, death, and hell with him. He had him. He took him away from the enemy. So Jesus now has, has given notice to evil that their days are numbered. But the reason that the, Jesus is waiting is because of the mission that he sent us on. Every one of us have a voice to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we are and whatever we do and open up the windows of heaven so that what happens is, as Dr. Leon says, that we, we plunder hell and we populate heaven. And because we can populate heaven through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I have no authority in ourselves, But all of our authority comes from God. So when we see these people in our day that are doing lawless deeds, lawless actions, recognize them as being motivated by evil. Well, it's kind of a weak uh, amen, but what, what we see is people that are doing evil things. And I hear with these ears people saying, well, you know, they, they, they're just poor. Or they're just, uh, they, they need help. Listen, just because you're poor doesn't mean you, uh, you're a thief. You can become a thief. The truth is, uh, what happens to us is just because we don't have a job doesn't mean we can become a drug addict. Listen, what give, makes people drug addicts and thieves is they're serving a different God. And because Satan is their master, and he wants to bring them into uh, great harm through the things that they do. I want to tell you what, also, just because Satan is their master doesn't mean that they can just go to a church and sit quietly and then go out and do corrupt things out in the streets. And they can say that they're working for Christ. Come on. Listen, when you're out burning churches, harming people, burning Bibles, you're not working for Christ. You're working for the other guy. And so I think that our message has been weak. Our message has been very, because we feel like we can just, if we're just nice enough to them, that they'll come and give their life to Christ. Listen, I don't care how nice you are to evil. You can be as nice as you want to evil, and it's still going to be evil. Don't let it come from your lips that you're saying that, you know, we, we need to to help these people in some way and, and bring them out. What you need to do is help them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The main message is you're a sinner, you're going to hell, but Jesus Christ has saved you and with his blood, but you have to accept it or you're going to go on to hell, leaving your ticket lay on the table. Because in our day, we have been way overboard with this concept of coming to church and just having a nice uh, CEO teach us how to be rich and be prosperous. Listen, God wants to bless your life, but the message is not God, uh, God says, I'm going to make you rich and prosperous. The message is, I'm going to make you holy. Amen. My blood was shed for you so that you could get forgiveness for sin. And that you could turn your life away from the works of darkness and look into the light of Christ and be of him. Amen. That message doesn't resonate in most churches across America. You know, they, they want to be, they want to be rich, but they don't, they don't want, people don't want anybody to tell them that they're living for, uh, for the devil rather than living for God. Listen, just because you heard a nice sermon doesn't mean you're on your way to heaven. What has to happen with us, you and I, is we have to live our lives the way that Jesus told us to live our lives. He's the one that's in control. He's the one that has the authority. 
The church has got to light up the world. I was working at, at the house yesterday, our house, and we had changed some lights in front, and I was working to change one in the back, and then I decided I had the wrong bulb, so I went and got new bulbs. And uh, last night when we had darkness, we had light on the outside of our house. And, and uh, I thought, you know, this is the way the kingdom of God is. He brings light into darkness. But you have to do something to get light into darkness. I'm not talking about works-based salvation. I'm talking about repentance-based salvation. You know, we have to quit uh, doing the things that the devil's happy with us about and do the things that God has called us to. You know, the devil, he likes for you to hear a nice little sermon in the church and then get up and go out and uh, act like hell when you get out there. He likes that. Just come on to church. Get lulled to sleep with somebody telling you that it's you, you're just doing all right and you're just doing really fine and you just go ahead and live the way you live. I think that we ought to be challenged every week. I think what God's word, when we sit down with God's word, we're not cherry picking it so that it makes us feel good. We're reading God's word so that it brings uh, light into our life and we can expel darkness. Here's what the scripture says in Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, you, who's he speaking to? Amen. So we're the yous. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, this isn't about personal pride. This is about lifting God up. You know, what we have, we're seeing, and I've heard this uh, in New York City now, what they're doing is they're bringing homeless people off the street. You can't, you can't use the gospel with them. You know, they're, they're just homeless people. Guess what? Yeah, you have to be tolerant. I, I, don't, I don't believe that we do have to be tolerant. So we say, what? I believe that what we have to do is have love. You know, we can be tolerant and leave somebody in a ditch. You know, that's just the way they want to live. But what God has called us to do is get them up out of the ditch through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to be bold about it, to speak into their lives and let them know, hey, the way you're going, you're going to end up dead or on your way to hell before you even know it. Because what happened, what, what's going on in your life is you're living corruptly. Someone says, well, that's not very nice. Listen, the pathway to hell is paved with people who have not had anybody be bold enough to them to shake them up to get the gospel of Christ in their life. Wrong is wrong. And do what? Oh, yeah. Get back to that. You know, in New York, they have these $700, $800 a night rooms, $1,200 a night rooms. They've opened up and made the hotels take the homeless people and put them in there. And with no, nothing required of them, I mean, you can't bring them in and give them a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, you just, well, we'll give you a key and you go to that room and do whatever you want. You know, what's happening is, you know, there's a lot of sexual perversion, pedoph pedophilia happening in this, in this time up there. And I, I believe you can be people that have that can be delivered from it. But I also believe they can't be delivered from it if nobody tells them that they need to be delivered from it. And so they're doing this in New York City with, and people living on the streets. You know, we're a third world nation when you look around. And the reason we're doing that, and it's happened very fast. Very fast. And the reason we're doing that is because of our desire to not 
offend anybody. We're living in a cultural time when, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. And I know that you teachers and the ones in the schools, you have to face that kind of stuff. And I was almost going to use another word, but and that kind of stuff all the time uh, in the schools. And the truth is, you know, kids like discipline. They feel safe in, when it's, there's discipline. You know, you don't have discipline, you're going to have chaos, I can tell you that much. And what chaos does is it breeds sin. It allows what is in the darkness because, you know, the, the Bible says that uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And there's some translations that say in the earth there was chaos. You know, things weren't in order. And God brought them in order the way he wanted them to be in order. The church must light up the world. Wherever we go, we have to light up the world. I think that, you know, we're struggling and dealing with this thing about wearing a mask wherever we go. I think it's something that the government wants us to do. But I also believe it's the first step in, in uh, the government bringing us into bondage. I saw where John MacArthur, they told John MacArthur he couldn't have church out in California. You know who John MacArthur is. He's a theologian. He needs to get an understanding of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, <clears throat> he said that we're going to have church. And they said, well, no, you can't have church. You know, yeah, exactly. Watch me. Open the doors himself for people to come into the house of God. And so uh, they had a judge, a federal judge, said, yeah, you know, John MacArthur, it, it, you can have church because the Constitution, number one, says you can. Yeah. And because the Constitution says that you can, you can. You know, we, we wanted, they wanted to add some caveats, which I don't think that he was really uh, observing those so much. But what's happening is... It's the first stage of bringing people under bondage when you tell them what they can and can't do, you know, with the sanctity of their own life. Amen. And I'm not talking about legal, illegal, lawful, not lawful. I'm just talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. So what, what you and I have got to do <clears throat> is we have to learn how the gospel shoves that forward with our lives because sometimes we want to take it just from the legal perspective but the gospel jesus called us to to assemble together on the first day of the week to bring ourselves together into the house of god to learn what the word of god says and to be under understanding of how the bible is 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 applied to us and how you and I can walk in the presence and the glory of God because we have the word of God living within us. And we come here to worship. It's nobody's business how we worship. We're not doing anything corrupt or illegal. But they're saying, well, you can't sing. So what's happening is we're seeing it in... in People are closing in on us and bringing us more and more into bondage. So it says, well, I can't go in a store if I don't wear a mask. Well, wear the stupid thing. Wear a mask. Guess what? I got one here. I wear it. You know, I want to be compliant, but I also want, want them to know that I have, I have freedom. Now, this is the United States of America. I, you know, I served in Vietnam. I fought in a war. We, shoot, we shot people. We got shot at. We had... All kinds of stuff happening to us. And the reason I, I served is because this nation has to be preserved. Is that right, John? We have to preserve this nation. We're fighting for our nation. And right now we're in a similar battle. It may be just words right now, but we're in a similar battle right now. And we have to stand up and be bold. Not obnoxious. Learn what this says. And when you see things that are 
coming against the church or coming against you or you see an unbeliever and you know they're an unbeliever, what does the Bible say about them? Franklin Graham has this one verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. So it starts out with love. But you and I have to be bold enough to step in to do the things that requ are required in order to keep us free. You see, the devil wants to bring you into bondage. He wants to rule the world. That's his deal. He thinks he's going to rule the world. Guess what? He's not going to rule the world. Jesus said this about the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The words of Jesus Christ and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So lawlessness is abounding. Matthew 24, if you know, Matthew 24 is a chapter about the end times. And it's about the things that are coming during the revelation period. But Matthew 24, verse 12 says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. You know why the love of many will grow cold? Because they won't be hearing the true words that come forth, the truths that Jesus speaks. They'll be restrained from feeling the fellowship of the saints. They'll be restrained from speaking about the power of the Holy Spirit. They'll be tossed in jail just like Paul was tossed in jail for rebuking a, a slave girl that, uh, and cast, casting the spirit out of that was in her. And they put him in jail because they said he was speaking words that were unlawful for them to hear. But Paul, guess what he did? Come on, somebody know it? At midnight? They began to sing. Paul said, let's have church. We're in jail. But that we can still have church, so let's have church. And the next thing you know, God began to work. Listen, God does. God, I think God's kind of standing there sometimes, wondering what what are we what are they going to do? I'm ready to work. I'm ready to do something for them, but they don't seem to be moving in the right direction. We, I think we all need to look at ourselves carefully. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow old, cold, excuse me. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Watch this. There's an endurance that we have to understand and have in our lives. It says he who endures to what? The end. The end, the end of what? Well, the end of whatever you're on. The end of this age, the end of this time, because this, this age will end, and Christ will call up the saints. And you and I need to keep ourselves ready. Listen, I, I believe that sometimes what happens is the devil comes along and tells us that our, our Christian life, we're not living our Christian right. You know, what, you know what you do when the devil comes along and tells you that you're not living your Christian life right? He, he, guess what? He doesn't have any dog in that hunt. The truth is, he has no right to say that to you. Because you're not listening to him. And he might be shouting, but to you it's just a whisper. I'm going to send you to the place that you need to go. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I, I don't think that I'm ready here. Or I don't think that I'm ready there. Listen, you start using those words, there's a thing that comes up that you can do. And that's start doing more of what you know that you want to do. But don't accuse yourself of not being ready for when Christ comes. Anybody that's Christ conscious recognizes that Jesus is going to come back. And if you're Christ conscious, that means that you're working on the right side. Hello? Amen. Come on. Don't let the devil tell you you're not working on the right side because he doesn't know what the right side is. You know, his entire existence has been working on the wrong side.
And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Somebody will say, well, I wish the Lord would hurry up and come. Well, guess what? What are you doing about verse 14 there? Because that's what uh, gets him moving. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The end's not going to come until we've preached the gospel in all the world and to all the nations. And then what's going to happen is it's going to come. Praise God. We've got some work to do. Listen, God's people remain his people. The devil can't take you away from God. Only you can take you away from God. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So it does, this scripture, I've seen people use this scripture and say, you know, that when you're giving, giving the gospel straight to somebody and they'll say, well, you know, it's pretty straight. You know, you probably want to put a little more good with that. Listen, I want people to understand that without Jesus Christ, things are about as bad as they, are, they can get at that point. And they're going to get worse for them later on. You know why? Because the truth is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge. You and I have got to give it to them straight. Now, people say, well, they've heard that gospel before. Listen, I heard the gospel preached a lot of times. And I know my wife did too. She grew up and went to a parochial school. We heard the gospel preached a lot of times. But at one time, we were ready to receive it. So you don't know what that person's one time is. You're making a decision for them about heaven or hell when you should be just making a decision about heaven. Because we don't know how many times that person has had the gospel spoken to them or their need for the gospel to be spoken to them. But it might be the time that you're speaking to them then. Some of you got children that aren't serving Christ. They're in danger. Some of you got relatives that aren't serving Jesus Christ. They're in danger. You need to let them know that there's a heaven to gain. Then hell is a hot place. We don't want to see anybody go that way. John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you, this is Jesus, that in me you may have peace. Watch this. He said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Where does peace re reside? In Christ. It resides in Christ. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I think Jesus enjoyed saying, he says, you know, don't worry. He says, uh, you know, just follow me, you know, be in me. Because in me, there's peace, and I've got it covered. I've already overcome the world. Guess what? <laughs> I've already overcome it. And the safety net has been cast out for you. Get in. I'm going to draw you in. Hello. So the last days are coming up. We have... Things that are going on in our nation, people that we need to pray for. Some of these people that are in Washington that are the leaders of the, uh, in the Senate and the House of Representatives, they need our prayer because some of them are acting like Jezebel. And I'm not just talking about a woman. Men can be acting like Jezebel too. They're acting like Jezebel and they're building their, uh, their case, so to speak, so that they can approach their leader and get these, these people in more and greater bondage. Listen, I hate what the Washington does with my money when I have to send it there. I don't know about you, but, you know, if they've spent one 
nickel of my money, our money, on an abortion, I'm flaming over it. I despise it. I hate those who come along and purport that thing and push it forward and advance it forward. I hate the spirit that they're operating in. And I, and I wish, would to God, that it was condemned to hell today. Would to God that there was no, never another uh, murder of a baby in a womb. Right now, today, bring it to pass. The Bible talks about the last days in Matthew 24, verse 4 through 14. These are the words of Jesus. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. There's a lot of deception going on around here. It's happening not only on the streets and in these uh, protest circles, but there's deception in business, there's deception everywhere, and there's deception that comes from the pulpits as well. When someone says, you don't have anything to worry about, you know, God loves you, honey. Well, sure he does. If you're living for him, he loves you. And you don't have anything to worry about if you're living for him, but he still loves you. And if you're not living for him, you've got a lot to worry about. Because hell is on your destination list. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all things must come to pass, but the end's not yet. These are the red, red letters, is what Jesus is saying. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and various places. How many have been seeing these things happen? I mean, we're having earthquakes in the United States in our, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Lots happening there. Verse 8. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up into tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I want to tell you, I think it's important for us to be wise in what we do, where we go, how we act. I saw this thing, you know, I'm not a I'm not a Black Lives Matter advocate because on one of their tenets they said go out find a white person kill them and take a video of it and then send it to us. I wasn't surprised by that. What surprised me a little bit was the fact that most people probably don't even know that. We have some of the leading pastors across this nation who are standing up with Black Lives Matter and advocating for them. And I'm not talking about uh, black pastors. I'm talking about all pastors. That's right. Amen. Some of these uh, larger mega churches are standing up. You know, I, I don't want to give, give them an avenue where they can say that, well, you don't know what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. Listen. Don't ask me to go to a Black Lives Matter and stand up, a rally, and stand up for people, because I won't. I might stand up on the other side and ask, you know, why, why are you advocating this? Why are you advocating violence? Why are you advocating, uh, you know, it's okay to, to steal, steal, kill, and destroy? Think about that. How many know what Satan has come to do? Yeah. And, and I, I just think that there's a lot of misguidedness because people have come under deception. Give them the truth. Tell them the truth. Because I, 
I'm, I'm the kind of person that thinks that if someone knows the truth, then they have an opportunity to act on that. And a lot of people will. But people are not knowing the truth. We had someone that uh, had said that they were approached or had uh, been hassled by somebody in regards to Black Lives Matter. And they said, well, you know, here's the truth. You know, if black lives really mattered, you know, they wouldn't be killing all these black babies. And I have to give a hand to that person and say they're on the right track. God bless you and watch over you. So we're living in these spiritual days, very spiritual times. I'm bringing it in for a landing here. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Some of that's a little bit of a sleight of hand in some of the things that they do. But, uh, you know, Satan has the ability to do some false, I wouldn't call them miracles, false actions, as people do. Uh, just like the the, wid the uh, young girl that followed Paul and his, uh, his friend and said, These men are, are servants of the Most High God. She's prophesying exactly what they did and what they were all about. Only she was doing it under the spirit of hell to try to make it obnoxious to people. Deceive, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 13.22, or Mark 13.22, are you here? It says, for false Christs and false prophets will rise up and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. You know, Springfield is becoming more and more, there's more Muslim religions, Buddhism, all the different ones are coming into Springfield more and more and more. These people are false Christs. They're preaching a false gospel. You know, when you hear somebody say, well, we accept all religions, know, to, know for sure that that person is an unbeliever. That's right. Amen. Come on. If you think I'm speaking falsely, let's sit down and talk about your theology. Because the truth is, there's only one way. Jesus said, I... Am. And do you notice how God identified himself as I am when he was in the Old Testament? And so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. And don't ever doubt it. You see, Jesus wants you to walk as one who is able to be able to tell and talk about your, your ministry and the work that God has done in your life and how he's ministered to you and what the truth is. Not their truth. I've heard this go around. Well, they're speaking their truth. What does that mean? There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. And so there's only one truth. We have to be certain in God. Matthew 24, 13 says, but he... Who endures to the end shall be saved. Why don't you stand with me? I don't know if anybody needs prayer.